Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're gonna to be talking about proteins. Proteins are another one of the four biological macromolecules that consist of amino acid monomers. Most importantly, proteins are the biological macromolecule that does things. They're the enzymes that make chemical reactions possible. They're the transporters that allow things to cross biological membranes. They're the antibodies that keep us safe. So stay tuned while we talk all about proteins. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today, we're continuing our conversation about biological macromolecules with a discussion about proteins. Along with lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids, proteins are the fourth major group of biological macromolecules. Like carbohydrates and nucleic acids, proteins are polymers. That means they consist of repeating monomeric subunits. In the case of proteins, those monomeric subunits are called amino acids. Just like we see with the other biological macromolecules, when we combine those monomers to form the polymer, it's gonna be performed through a dehydration synthesis, also known as a condensation reaction. In the case of proteins, this is gonna be done by an organelle called the ribosome through a process known as translation. And the chemical covalent bonds that are gonna form in between those amino acids are known as peptide bonds. Now, if we want to break those peptide bonds down, we're going to need things like proteases and peptidases to perform a hydrolysis reaction, whereby we re-add water back in between those bonds to drive those bonds apart and, and turn the molecule back into its monomeric amino acid subunits. So, why are proteins so important? Well, in large part, proteins are the biological macromolecules that get work done inside the cell. They're the transporters that help bring things across the selectively permeable plasma membrane, which is formed by lipids. They are the enzymes that do hydrolysis and dehydration synthesis and all the other kinds of chemical reactions that are required for the cell in order to survive. But how are proteins made? Well, in order to understand what proteins look like, why they behave the way they do, and how they're formed, we have to learn about the monomers. Now, in the case of nucleic acids, we learned that there are four nucleotide monomers. But in the case of amino acids, there are actually 20 different amino acid monomers that make up proteins. And you can see them here. Now, all amino acids have a very similar basic structure. You have a central carbon. And on one end of that central carbon, you have an amine group. On the other end of that central carbon, you have a, carbox, a carboxyl group. And remember, these functional groups impart different properties on each end of the molecule. The amine group is slightly positively charged and can act kind of as an acid, or as a base, whereas the carboxylic end is weakly negatively charged uh, and can form, form an acid, hence the term uh, amino acid, an amine group on one end and a carboxylic acid group on the other. And when we add amino acids to each other, it's always the amine group of one amino acid being attached to the carboxylic or the carboxyl group of the other end of the next amino acid in order. So if you look at any protein, there is an amino end at the very start and a carboxyl end at the other, a carboxy end. So it is the amine group, then the carboxy group, uh, car uh, carboxyl group of one amino acid attached to the amine group, and then the carboxyl group of another, and so on and so forth in the chain. The other thing coming off of that central carbon is what is called the R group. And if you remember about our conversation about biological chemistry, an R group can really be anything. And there are 20 different R groups that are attached to those central carbons and all the different amino acids. And this is very important because these R groups all have different chemical structures and in particular, different abilities to interact with water. Some of those R groups are charged which makes them hydrophilic. They like to be associated with water. While others are hydrophobic in nature. They don't wanna have anything to do with water. So when we build these proteins out of hundreds or thousands of different amino acids, one of the things that's gonna dictate the shape of that resultant protein is how those amino acid side chains, those R groups, interact with the aqueous environment around them. And it turns out when it comes to proteins, shape is essential. Proteins, once they are created, have to fold properly. They have to take on the proper 
three-dimensional shape in order to be able to perform the function that they're expected to do within the cell. It turns out with proteins, there are four different levels of protein folding or protein structure that we need to discuss. The first level of protein folding is what we call the primary structure. And you can see we abbreviate it thusly, one with a little degree symbol next to it. This is what we call the primary structure. The primary structure of a protein is quite simply the linear sequence of amino acids that make up that particular protein in order. It's essentially a one dimensional thing. You can write it on a piece of paper. So for example, you might just see methionine, lysine, proline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the primary structure. And when that protein begins emerging from the ribosome, very briefly, the first amino acids linked together that emerge, that are bonded to each other may take on sort of that primary structure. But one of the first things that's gonna happen is eventually this protein is going to begin to interact. The amino acids within that protein are going to interact with each other as well as the aqueous environment. And very shortly after that protein begins to emerge from the ribosome, as it's being synthesized, there are going to be interactions that occur between the amino acid backbones. That is the amine groups and the carboxyl groups that are a part of every amino acid. And they're be go going to begin to stack up on each other to give the protein a three-dimensional shape. This is what we call the secondary structure. The secondary structure typically takes the form of, of either alpha helices, corkscrews, or pleated sheets or beta sheets, okay? But what you can see start to happen is this, uh, this protein is now no longer a linear sequence of amino acids based on the hydrophobic and hydrophilic interactions as well as the interactions and the hydrogen bonding of the, uh, of the amino acid backbones, we are starting to get a three-dimensional shape forming. And the big thing to note is that because this protein is becoming three-dimensional, amino acids that are nowhere near each other in terms of the primary structure, i.e. amino acid one and amino acid 100, in the linear structure, when we get into the three-dimensional structure, they could be right next to each other. And this is gonna allow for higher level interactions. Now, eventually what's gonna happen as enough of these amino acids are being produced, as they begin to grow, as the protein begins to grow, the R groups are going to become involved. For example, hydrophobic R groups are going to try to go towards the middle portion of the protein, away from the water, whereas the hydrophilic ones are gonna to wanna to line up on the outside of the protein, okay? But the other thing that's gonna happen is this. Some of these R groups are polar entities and can hydrogen bond with other R groups from other amino acids. Some of them are able to covalently bond. So remember our sulfhydryl groups from our conversation about functional groups. Sulfhydryl groups from, from amino acids that are nearby can actually covalently bond to, find, to form disulfide bridges. We can have ionic bonds forming from the charged R groups of various amino acids. And all of these interactions are going to result in the formation of the tertiary structure. And the tertiary structure is really where we begin to form sort of the business shape of the molecule. The tertiary structure is responsible for forming the active sites of enzymes that make them so specific with respect to the substrates with which they're gonna interact. They form the pores or the channel region of transport proteins that are gonna bring things across plasma membranes. And it's this tertiary structure that is essential for a protein to be able to function. And sometimes what can happen is mutations get introduced that alter the amino acid composition of a protein, and that can have a dramatic effect on the activity of that protein. The other thing a tertiary structure is essential for is in some proteins, some proteins there's a fourth level of folding, which is known as the quaternary fold or the quaternary structure. The quaternary structure only occurs in proteins that have multiple subunits, i.e. they're comprised of multiple different proteins all interacting at the same time. A great example of this is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin consists of two alpha subunits, two alpha proteins, and two beta subunits, or two beta proteins. In order for hemoglobin to function correctly, in order for it to be able to bind and carry oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout your bloodstream, these three proteins all need to come together appropriately to form the right quaternary structure, which allows it to coordinate iron, and the iron is what allows it to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. 
But without the proper tertiary structure, the proper quaternary structure could never happen, could never occur. And that's exactly what happens in the cases of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is a blood disease that is caused by a mutation in one of the hemoglobin subunits. In the hemoglobin subunit, that particular amino acid, glutamic acid, is actually replaced by another amino acid, valine, that has different properties. This impacts the structure of that particular protein so that when that hemoglobin is present in, in, in the red blood cells in this particular individual, those red blood cells can take on like a sickle shape, which prevent it from carrying oxygen and carbon dioxide. It basically makes it more challenging for this person to transport oxygen and it can lead to things like sickle cell crises because these sickle shaped blood cells can block blood vessels. They can also make it very difficult because the body has to eliminate them uh, at a very rapid rate. And this is all due to the fact that a single amino acid change impacts the primary, which impacts the secondary, which impacts the tertiary, and eventually the quaternary structure of the protein causing an entire, uh, entire disease manifestation throughout the entire body, all because of a single nucleotide substitution. And that's how exquisitely important protein structure is. That's how important those covalent and ionic and hydrogen bonds and hydrophobic interactions that form the secondary and tertiary, and then maybe sometimes the quaternary structure of a protein are to allowing that protein to function properly. The inability of a protein to maintain its proper three-dimensional shape can have dramatic consequences on the cell. In fact, proteins, because of the nature of the amino acids that make them up, are exquisitely sensitive to both temperature and pH. Because temperature and pH changes can alter the way those functional groups interact with each other. Those R groups interact with each other. And it can destroy disulfide bridges. It can destroy hydrogen bonds and disrupt covalent bonds. And the result could be the collapse of the three-dimensional structure of a given protein or lots of different proteins. That particular phenomenon is known as denaturation. Denaturation is the collapse of a three-dimensional protein structure. Now, sometimes this is reversible. If it happens very briefly and only subtly, we actually have proteins in our body called protein chaperones that can go around and help proteins refold. But prolonged exposure to pH that's too high or too low, prolonged exposure to temperatures that are too high or too low, can cause irreversible damage to the proteins in the cell and actually end up killing the cell. This is actually what happens, for example, when we use heat to kill bacteria. Moist heat, for example, causes massive denaturation of proteins that make it impossible for that particular cell to survive. Remember, if we disrupt protein structure, we're disrupting all of the enzymatic reactions that make their metabolism possible. We disrupt all of the membrane receptors that make it possible to sense the ex extracellular environment. We make it impossible for the cell to maintain its three-dimensional shape. We make it impossible for things to cross the plasma membrane. And if this goes on long enough, the cells die. It's also one of the reasons why fevers can be so harmful. If somebody has a fever that's too high for too long, it can actually irreversibly denature the proteins that are in the person's brain cells. And once those proteins are irreversibly denatured, those cells are going to die. And the end result is, is brain death, essentially, because of the loss of too much of their brain matter. So as I mentioned, proteins are responsible for basically the majority of functions that occur within a cell. But proteins are also hugely responsible for your ability to resist infections. Proteins have a huge role in your immune system and they impact us both in positive and negative ways. So for example, our immune cells need to be able to communicate with each other. That's why our immune cells secrete very small proteins that are known as cytokines. And these cytokines are able to allow cell, immune cells to communicate with each other. They can send communication in terms of, please come here, I need help. They can trigger the inflammatory response and they can trigger replication of other immune cells uh, to make them grow and divide. Our, pro, our immune system also produces proteins that are called antibodies. And antibodies go around interacting with foreign invaders, things like um, viruses and, and pathogenic bacteria, and they label them for destruction. And our other immune cells that carry protein, proteinaceous receptors on their surface can recognize these antibodies and go around consuming things, things like neutrophils and macrophages. They go around eating cells that have been labeled by those proteinaceous antibodies. But proteins can also be harmful to us.
For example, many bacteria produce proteins that are called exotoxins, things like tetanospasmin and botulinum toxin. These can negatively impact our body and cause the symptoms. So for example, if you're exposed to uh, tetanus and you're exposed to the tetanospasmin uh, 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 toxin, that can actually cause extreme muscle contractions, which leads to what we call lockjaw or tetanus or tetany. On the other hand, the botulinum toxin can actually paralyze our muscles and it can cause us to actually you get this descending paralysis where you, uh, get, uh, you get um, an inability to use the facial muscles and eventually it can actually paralyze your diaphragm. This is what happens when you get botulism. It's also how Botox works. So Botox is just a pharmaceutically produced version of this toxin uh, that can paralyze uh, facial muscles. It's also used to treat chronic migraines, for example, because of the effect that it has on our neurons. Another type of protein we have to be on the watch out for is what's called a prion. Prions are very unique in the world of pathogens because they are the only pathogen that consists entirely of a protein. No nucleic acid, it's a non-living entity. It's nothing, it's just a protein that's misfolded. Certain proteins can form what we call a prion state. It's a misfolded version of this, of this particular prion or this particular protein. And when this prion interacts with other proteins, it causes them to misfold as well, to essentially denature. And as these things invade our cells, they cause lots of different proteins within the cells to actually uh, misfold and then cause the cell to no longer be able to survive. Prions are what causes in, in animals, uh, they, they cause diseases that are called spongiform encephalopathies. In humans, these are known as Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, mad cow disease, or Kuru. And we believe that prions are mainly acquired through ingestion that you eat them. In other animals, particularly ones that we eat, it's known as scrapie in sheep, or mad cow disease, or bovine uh, spongiform encephalopathy in cows, chronic wasting disease in deer. These are all prion-based diseases. The scary part about prions is this. There is no treatment for them. If you're exposed to them and you do end up with a prion disease, there's no ability to treat it, and it is 100% fatal. Because over time, it will cause the proteins in your brain cells to misform, then those brain cells will die, and you will end up with, quite literally, holes in your brain, which will be evident upon your autopsy. We also have no way of cooking them out. They're not like viruses or bacteria where you can just cook meat long enough for them to go away. They're practically indestructible. So there really isn't a good way to sur surveil for them, to know if they're in our food, nor is there really a good way to cook them out if you're exposed. The other scary part is it could take 15, 20, sometimes 30 years before you even begin to manifest symptoms of that fatal disease. So while proteins are essential for our immune system, there are also these crazy versions of proteins called prions that can go around and make us really, really sick. So you can see proteins have a lot of different roles in terms of our health. So that's it for our conversation about proteins. Remember, proteins are uh, biological macromolecules that include our enzymes and transporters and receptors and antibodies and all that good stuff. They are polymers that consist of amino acid monomers that are bonded together through peptide bonds, mainly by the ribosome. So I hope you guys learned a lot today and I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you so much for tuning in.